we've been in a series called Satisfied as we've talked about what it means to be satisfied in God's presence, what it means to be satisfied in our bodies, and today we're going to talk about what it means to be satisfied in our minds. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and go to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be in verses 1 and 2 this morning. So I'm going to read it for us, and then we'll pray, and then we'll jump in. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, I want to present to you a principle that um, has helped me a lot in my little time here on earth, but it's this. What you think about is what you care about, and what you care about is what you chase. So I'll give one example from my life. Um, I was at UMHB, and Katie was at Texas A&M, and I met her, and I thought she was cute, and so I started to think about her a lot, right? I thought she was funny. I thought she was witty, and so I started to think about her and wonder, who is Katie? Like, what makes Katie Katie, right? What does she like to do? You know, what does she want to do in her life? What is, like, what does she think about this God? And I I even thought thoughts like, I wonder if she likes me, right? Does she think I'm awkward? Does she think I'm weird? Like, Like, what does, do I even have a chance with a girl like that. So I began to think about her. So I began to care about her. So I cared about her family. I cared about what she liked. I cared about what she didn't like. I cared that she liked the Rangers and not the Astros. And so I turned her into an Astros fan, right? So I cared about what she cared about. And so I chased her. I texted her, right? Hey, what are you doing, right? Hey, what do you think about this, right? I texted her. I called her all the time. Um, I got to know her family. So I would go and hang out with her family. Uh, just so that I could score points with knowing that she thought I was cool because I was hanging out with her family. I like her family. They're here, so I have to say that. But um, but, so I I did things for her, right? And eventually I bought a ring, right? And I locked it down. We got married. So I thought about her, I cared about her, and I chased her. And so the question before we jump into the text is, what what consumes your mind? Like, when you think about this week, what did you think about? And if, we, if you want to know what you think about, work backwards. Because what you chase reveals what you care about. And what you care about reveals what you think about. And so we're going to be in Romans 12, 1, talking about the mind. And so he says, I appeal to you, therefore. I appeal to you, Therefore, now, as the cliche goes, you can finish it if you want, if you know it, um, when you see therefore, you have to ask the question, what is it there for, right? And so, Paul starts this off, so you can think of Romans kind of in, in, in two sections, right? Romans 1 through 11, and then Romans 12 on. Romans 12 shifts to more of the practical, okay? So when Paul says therefore, he is referring to all that he has laid out in Romans 1 through 11, now, we don't have a year or 20 years to pack out all of Romans 1 through 11, right? Because Romans 1 through 11 is heavy, but I want to give you a brief summary because it will help us as we talk about Romans 12.1. So four quick things, and it's just going to be a few minutes, um, about Romans 1 through 11. Essentially, Paul lays out the gospel in Romans 1 through 11. He lays out just the clear and simple gospel. And here's the first thing that we learn from Romans Romans 1 through 11. The stain of sin goes deeper than we think. The stain of sin goes deeper than we think. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God. And then Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all of humanity has a bend towards sin not towards God, that humanity's first instinct is not to worship God. It's not. You, and our instinct is not to run to God with everything that we have, that our first instinct in this earth was to run to the world and to run to sin. I, um, when I was in college, I got a job at BCYC. Do you know what that is? 
Uh, it's right down the road here, and it was kind of an after-school program, program for kids. And I was really excited about it because I was going to be in charge of the rec. So kickball, basketball, all that stuff. And um, two days before, I tore my MCL. And so I showed up to the first day of work with crutches. So I walk in, and the supervisor's like, dude, you can't, you can't do rec. Like, you can't kick a ball. Like, how are you going to play with the kids? And so she had the grand idea to put me with the kindergartners. Okay? Now, I'm 19 years old, and I don't have little brothers or sisters. I've never babysat anybody in my life. And I walk into this room, and there are 40 of them. 40, now, you're laughing because you're probably a parent, and you know how, where this story is going, right? And so I walk in, there's 40 of them, and so I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be so easy. I'm so glad I tore my MCL. We're just going to watch VeggieTales, and they're going to draw and color, and they're going to tell stories about me when they get married, about how they had this teacher who just changed their life. And so I walk in, they're like really patient and kind, and the supervisor is kind of introing me. But then, like, guys, it was a nightmare, right? <laughs> like, they got their crowns, and they drew on the wall. They were throwing their crowns at each other. One kid bit another kid so hard that he started to bleed everywhere, okay? It was just chaos. And I, I swear this happened. Um, one of the kids, I think, tried to take my crutch so that he could hit another kid with it, right? I still have nightmares about that day. It, it's traumatizing, okay? Now, here's the deal. I thought, I walked out of that room, and I thought, who taught them that? Like, like, do you as parents go to your children and say, look, here's how you bite another kid, okay? You take your mouth, you put it on their arm, and you just go down as hard as you can until you taste blood, right? Do you teach your kids that? No, you don't. I'm not a parent, and I know that you don't teach your kids that, okay? You don't. And so I walked out, and I went, who taught them that? Like, who taught them to draw on the wall and to throw stuff at each other? No one. They were naturally bent to do that because the stain of sin goes deeper than we know. It goes deeper than we think. And that leads to the second thing that we learn from Romans is that in that, God doesn't leave us there. He has shown grace to us by sending Jesus to save us from the penalty of sin. The rest of that Romans 3 passage says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to, re- to be received by faith. And then Romans 5.8 but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God came from perfect heaven to broken earth and put on flesh. Think about this. He put on flesh, lived a sinless and perfect life so that we could be saved from our sin. That's the gospel. And then that leads to the third point, that God's saving grace gives us freedom. Here's what he says in Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation For those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Because he saved you, you're not a slave to sin anymore. And you're not a slave to the law, to morality. You are free. And that thing you did that you never thought you would do, if you're in Christ, if you put your faith in him, he does not condemn you for it. He does not condemn you for it. Which goes to the next thing, the last thing that God will never strip away that love. The love that he has for you as his son or daughter, he'll never strip it away. Romans 8, 38 through 39, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? Separate us from the love of Christ. So when he says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore, that's what he's talking about. That you have a stain of sin. You are bent towards the world, but God has sent Jesus to save you, and you are free, and the affection that he put on you, he will never take it away. So when we read Romans 12, 1, it's going to make sense. Because here's what he says. Therefore, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship. This isn't morality. This isn't do this and don't do that so that you can be okay with God. This isn't 
social duty. That we do this because this is what my family does. My parents bring me here. Or this is what people in Central Texas do. No, no, no. Presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, as an offering, is taking all of that makes you you, everything that you are, and saying you are better. <laughs> like, like everything that makes you you, your, your time, your family, your hobbies, right? Your, your, everything that you do, your career, your money, it's the most natural thing for us to do when hearing Romans 1 through 11 that all that God has done is to go, I'm yours. Whatever you want, I am yours. My time, my money, my family, my thoughts, my trajectory in life, it's all yours because of what you have done. I offer all of it. That's worship. To go, you are better that in the midst of your sorrows, when things are hard, that you don't run. You don't run to whatever that sin is, and you don't turn off your mind and just watch Netflix. That when things are hard, and you're in the midst of those sorrows, you say, Jesus, you are better. I will run to you. That in all of the comforts of this world, right, all the cushy things that make us feel okay about ourselves, that we can escape to, that we don't run to them, that we run to Jesus. Your bank account, that you don't live a life that's just built on building that that you say, this is yours, so whatever you want, Lord, I'm going to give it to you, right? All the things that make us, us, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice is going, it's all yours. So you might say, oh, Colton, that was really good. Good job. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> like, like, how do I do that? You don't know me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how complicated my life is. You don't know how my brain works, like, like, how does that work? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 12, 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If verse 1 is our response to the gospel, the good news of what God has done, worship, then verse 2 is the means to how we do that. So here's the question. Do you want to be a worshiper? Do you want to worship? Do you want to worship God? It starts with the mind. It starts with the mind. Your mind is the gateway to true worship. So let me say three things about verse 2 that help us think about our minds at being satisfied in God. What it means to have the mind satisfied. And here's the first thing that we learned from verse 2. It starts with transformation. That in order for us to worship God, we must have our minds transformed. So transformed from what? Well, Romans 8, 7 says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Think about that. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. And our minds, if you read Romans 1 through 3, is naturally bent towards the world towards our flesh. And here's the deal, and you know this, all around you, the world tries to tell you how to think, right? Like everywhere you look, you go to the store and you see a million different items telling you how your body should look, right? Or what you should buy. You go to Facebook, and not only are all the crazy people on your timeline telling you how to think, but Google knows what you search for. And so all the ads are telling you how to think, right? And so you look everywhere, and the world is telling you how to think. They want you to think that your life is your own, that you don't need God, that you can do it, that you don't belong to him, that the world wants to convince us that our lives is about money, it's about sex, it's about power. And everywhere around us, everything is going after our Minds, and it's important. It's important if we're going to talk about the mind that first we acknowledge that the world does not think like you do. If you're renewed in Christ and you have put your faith in Him, the world does not think like us. Here's what Ephesians 4:18 says: They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Second Corinthians 3:14 says, "But their minds." 
were hardened. Listen to Jesus, how, how Jesus explains it uh, to the Pharisees. And I have this passage up here. Uh, we'll put that on the screen uh, because it's kind of a wordy passage, but it's helpful to us. He, here's what he says in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. It says, The Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. <laughs> you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. So what's happening here? The Pharisees and Sadducees show up, and they say, hey, they want to know if he's the Messiah. Like, he's been claiming that he's God, so, um, so show us a sign that you're God. And so they ask for a sign, and Jesus turns it on them. Okay, and there's this interesting exchange. He says, you have the capabilities, right, to look up at the sky and determine what kind of weather it will be. So he gives them two examples. He says, the sky is red. You can look and see the sky is red, so that it will be fair weather. And then he says, you can look up at the sky and see that it's red and threatening. <laughs> right? So it's like, I don't know. I think that, like, if our um, weather people did that, like, if you look at the sky, it's threatening, so it's going to be stormy. Right? I don't know. I thought that was funny. Um, and so you can look up at the sky, and it's red and threatening, so it's going to be stormy weather. So basically, he says this. You can look at evidence and determine an outcome. So he says, you can interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the time. What's he saying there? He's saying, you have the capabilities to look at me and make an outcome in your mind of who I am. Like, you can look at evidence of what I'm doing from, from the scriptures and what I'm doing here, and you can make a determ determination about who I am. Am. He's, he's fulfilling the Old Testament. He's healing the sick. He's feeding the poor. He's the good shepherd. So why can't they see that? Well, he says, it's because you're an adulterous generation. Think about that. <laughs> you can't see it because you're adulterous, which kind of feels like it's out of, out of left, like, kind of feels like it's out of left field. Like, hey, Jesus, show us a sign. Well, the problem is you're an adulterer. It's like, what? <laughs> okay. What's happening? Well, he's the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom, and they're to be his bride. And the bride doesn't want to love the groom. Doesn't. The problem wasn't with their capabilities to think. It was that their minds were blind. They wanted something else. They couldn't see the signs. Isn't that interesting? Here's the deal. Our minds are not bent to see evidence and go, wow. I'm in. We need an outside source to come in and transform us. Here's what we need. We need a miracle. In order for our minds to be renewed and satisfied in God, we need a miracle. Here's what, um, the, the, second, the second point is that transformation in your minds starts with the Holy Spirit. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of of your mind. The only other place that specific word in the original language appears, renewal, is in Titus 3.5. And here's what it says. It's helpful. It says, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So transformation happens when God takes your blindfold off, takes your darkened mind, and opens it up to the goodness of of God, that the Spirit goes, look, look at who I am, and the Spirit begins to fill your mind with the things of God. Like, have you ever um, read your Bible, and you're reading a passage that you've read before, or your pastor is preaching about a passage that you've heard before, and you go, huh, I've never thought about that. That ever happened to you? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit in your mind making sense of his word. And making sense of what I'm saying, right? Consider um, the, the road to Emmaus, right? You know that story? Um, it's after Jesus dies. It's in Luke chapter 24. And these two guys are walking from Jerusalem uh, to Emmaus. And the text says that they were just talking about everything that had just happened. And then Jesus shows up. 
And in Luke 24, 16, it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So he comes up to him and he says, hey, what are you talking about? And it says they stood still, looking sad, and they go, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happening? (laughs) They're like, where have you been? And so they begin to tell him everything that's happened with him, that the chief priests and the scribes and the rulers um, crucified a guy, a prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth and a woman, and women from their company went to the tomb where he was buried and it was empty. And it was this amazing thing. And Jesus begins to teach them the scriptures. And when they broke bread, what does it say? And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. We need God to open our minds. We need it. Like even right now while I talk, think about this. Even while I talk, the Spirit is working in some of your mind to open your eyes to what I'm saying, to stir your affections for him, to to want him more, to want to grow, to make sense of the scriptures. And some of you, you're bored. Are you thinking about the Cowboys game? Are you thinking about what you're going to do for lunch? Are you thinking about logistics of what is going on? Like some of you, you're, you've got your, the blindfold is on, and you can't hear. Does that make sense? We need God to open our minds. Here's the deal. Like thinking, thinking about the mind, you can read your Bible 24 hours a day and less, listen to every, or podcast every preacher on the planet. Like you can do that. You can fill your mind up with data, but until the Spirit renews your mind, none of it's going to make sense. None of it will make sense. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words and wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Like, it's not my job up here to be the most charismatic and funny and coolest person that you've ever heard speak. That's not my job. My job is to present to you the Word of God and pray and ask that God would stir your affections. Because I can't do it. Matthew can't do it. I could prepare the most logical, fantastic, great sermon you've ever heard, and it could hit a wall. It's happened. Like, I've walked off stage before, and and Matthew can probably attest to this. Like, the best sermon, I thought I was, like, the best in the world. And I walked off, and it was like, oh, good job. And everyone, like, there's nothing happened, right? And then there's times when you preach the worst sermon in the world, and you're awkward, right? You're, You're not prepared. You're illogical. Things don't connect and make sense. Maybe it's this sermon right now. I don't know. (laughs) But God works. People are saved. Lives are transformed. Why? Because it's not up to me, and it's not up to you. It's God's power showing off. It's the Holy Spirit working in you to make sense of what God is doing in your minds. That's a renewal of the mind. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, when, when uh, I was youth minister, I would take kids to youth camp, and I would have these kids all year long, and I would preach the gospel, gospel to them constantly, and to the best of my ability, I was trying to be the greatest youth minister in the world, and, um, and I would preach the gospel to them, and then we would go to youth camp, and every single year on the last night of camp, at least one or two students would come up to me, and they would go, man, this, the guy preaching, like, I've never heard that before, and I would be like, Yes, you have. Like, you've heard it a million times. You're in church every single week. But their minds couldn't hear it. Their minds couldn't hear it until the Spirit woke them up. And so you never approach the Word of God without first asking God to open up your mind because He's the one who does it. He's the one who does it. The third thing I would say is that a renewed mind is able to discern the will of God. If the natural tendency of the mind is to be conformed to the world, then a renewed mind is bent towards the things of God. So, how do we know what the will of God is? Well, Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we will know what the will of God is by testing. So how do you test something? What's he talking about? 
Well, it's pretty simple, actually. We te- you test something through God's word and through God's people. That as the world tries to convince you how you should think, that you bring that to his word and you bring that to his people and you say, what's true? And if it doesn't match up with God's word, then that's not true. Only truth comes from God's word. And so whatever you hear, like students, kids, from your parents, whatever you hear, you take that to the, to the word of God. Whatever you hear from your teachers, whatever you hear in the workplace, whatever you hear on the news, like whatever truth people are trying to get into your mind, you take that to the word of God and you say, is this true? And you take that to the people of God, to your home groups, to your discipleship groups, and you say, hey, I heard this. What's true? And you work that out together. I love what um, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2 7. He says, he tells Timothy, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So he throws a bunch of illustrations at Timothy, and Timothy doesn't understand them. And so Paul says, hey, think hard about these things, and the Lord will give you understanding. See, I think we tend to do one or the other in the American Christian church. We tend to either think a lot about the things of God. So I'm going to study the Greek language. I'm going to read all these books. I'm going to study my Bible 24-7. And we process a lot of data about God, but we don't really understand why they matter. And so we have a lot of knowledge about God, but we have no love for God. And we have no love for people. I can relate to that. Because when I was, I don't know, several years ago, like I was a Christian studies major, and I just started just putting as much data in my mind as I could, like falling asleep to Matt Chandler sermons and other preachers and just like studying and reading and and doing all the things, everything I could do to process God's word. But you know what I wasn't doing? I wasn't praying. I wasn't confessing my sin. I wasn't asking the Lord for help. And so I was a jerk. I was just a jerk. I did not love people well. I did not treat people well. I did not care about my roommates. I was an absolute jerk. I didn't care about what happened to people. There was about a year and a half where I went without ever talking to a non-believer. Not one. Because I didn't care about them. I knew all the things. I, I could tell you what every single chapter of Romans and the gospel said. But I couldn't love people. I wasn't capable of it because the Lord had not given me understanding. And then some people, some of us can go to the other side, where we just, we say we understand everything, and we kind of just walk through life without ever reading the Bible, and just kind of say, well, I believe in God. But we never study. We never think to where we can say, here's why I believe in God. Here's what he's done, that I've fallen short of the glory of God, and he has redeemed me. That I've sinned, but he doesn't condemn me for it because I'm free. So he says, think hard on these things, and the Lord will give you understanding. That's why when you approach his word, you never approach it without asking him to help. Asking him to make sense of these things in your mind. Um, if, if If we approach the word of God as if it's data, if we approach it as if um, we want to look like we know a lot, but we have no love, we have completely missed the point. And you're a hypocrite. And so we have to be very careful when we think. Because if you think and you have no love, then you've missed it. You've missed it. You've not worshipped. I'm almost out of time, and so there's... There's one last thing. I want to kind of do a sidebar here. Um, And I was praying about whether or not to bring this up, um, to say this. Um, But if we're going to talk about the mind, then we have to talk about the realities of mental illness. That I believe that there are some in this room who, when I'm talking, as I'm talking about the mind, you're struggling because of something that's happening in your own mind. Maybe it's depression, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's OCD, I don't know what it is. Um, There's lots of options 
And last week, um, I don't know if you heard about this, but there was a pastor in California named Jared Wilson who took his own life. He was a pastor in a megachurch. He had written several popular books. He, um, he started a, a Christian suicide outreach organization called Anchor of Hope, and he took his own life. That morning, he had done a funeral for someone who had took their own life. And then that, later that afternoon, he took his own life. And my dad took his own life in 2009. And so I'm, I'm a son of a father um, who did that. And so I know for me, there were times, d- days, uh, where I, f- I didn't connect with God. Like something in my brain wouldn't do it. And something in my brain couldn't talk about it with people. And so I, I think if we're going to talk about the mind, then we have to acknowledge a couple things. One um, is that there, you're here, that there are people in this room where Because of what's happening in your mind, you can't connect with God, and you can't connect with people. And so first thing I want to say is keep fighting, and we want to fight with you. I know the hardest thing may be that you invite us into that. Because there's a stigma, I think, in the church, and it's sad, and maybe it's just the world, but there's a stigma that if there's something wrong with your mind, then there's something wrong with you. And that's not true. And so I want to ask you if you would invite us into that conversation, that you would invite me, Matthew, a home group leader, whoever that is, to fight that fight with you. And the second thing I would, I would say is um, seek out help. We want to shepherd you. We want to point you, like our job is to point you to the things of Jesus, to, make sin, to, to help to guide you in seeing who God is like we can point, we'll point out all the scriptures and we'll pray with you and ask the Lord to work on your mind and to awaken and renew your mind. But there are also like people in our community and, and even in this church who have given their life to study the mind. And so I would say never be ashamed of getting help. And we want to help you with that. Yeah. And then the last thing about it I would say, um, I know for me in those days, um, it felt like everything was dark and I couldn't see God um, and that he wasn't with me. And I know that I'm guessing that there's some of you in this room, you just don't see it. Like, like you live, your mind is, is darkened because of the disconnect that's happening. And I want you to know that God has not left you. He has not left you. He is present with you right now. And he will continue to be present with you every single day. He will never leave you. And so I just wanted to give that invitation because I know it's a hard subject, um, but I don't want to just ignore it as well. So let me finish um, with this, thinking about the mind. To have a satisfied mind is to have a renewed mind. And so the first step is not to learn more data. (laughs) The first step is to pray and ask that God would open your mind. And then I also, I would say, identify. Identify the things in the world that are loudest in your mind. Is it loud? Like, is it, you always hear it? You always hear the temptation coming after you? And then the, the other thing I would say is don't run. The easiest and most dangerous thing is not, the easiest, most dangerous thing is to run to Netflix or to run to a hobby and just try to escape. Think hard on these things and the Lord will give you understanding.